You probably never heard about this before, but I want to tell you about God's holy hitman and the fella who talked to his ass. You see, God made a special, unique covenant of peace with his holy hitman. We all want peace with God, but nobody else ever got their own unique deal for being God's executioner. This once in a lifetime divine promise was granted to a man named Pinchas. He was the son of Eleazar and grandson of Aaron, the priest. His English name was Phineas. His great uncle was actually Moses. Now Phineas's claim to fame was being in the right place at the right time and instinctively doing the right thing that at any other time would have been an unthinkably wrong thing to do. And he was mightily blessed for acting violently in haste. <laughs> the account is dramatic and startling. It says, while the Israelites were camped at Acacia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods, so the Israelites feasted with them and worshiped the gods of Moab. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal of Peor, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against his people. Now, one of the aspects of the parties thrown by the Moabite gals was to invite all the fellas to engage in wild orgies. When worshipers of Baal brought their sacrifices to this pagan god, it included ritually authorized sexual immorality. After all, Baal was also their god of fertility. The Lord issued the following command to Moses, seize all the ringleaders and execute them before the Lord in broad daylight, so his fierce anger will turn away from the people of Israel. So. Moses ordered Israel's judges. He said, each of you must put to death the men under your authority who have joined in worshiping Baal of Peor. God knew very well how easily the men of Israel would get carried away with this pagan form of worship. Let's face it, offers of free sex gathers a crowd. And God also knew that there was only one way to combat this temptation. His attitude about the correct form and timing of his chosen punishment was made unmistakably clear in the next verse. Just then, one of the Israelite men brought a Midianite woman into his tent right before the eyes of Moses and all the people as everyone was weeping at the entrance of the tabernacle when Phinehas, son of Eleazar, grandson of Aaron the priest, saw this, he jumped up left the assembly, he took a spear and rushed after the man into his tent. Phineas thrust the spear all the way through the man's body and into the woman's stomach. They were obviously in a compromised position where one spear could skewer them both simultaneously. Awkward, but effective. So the plague against the Israelites was stopped but not before 24,000 people had died. Then the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar and grandson of Aaron the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites by being as zealous among them as I was. So I stopped destroying all Israel as I had intended to do in my zealous anger. And that act of violence earned him his reward. Now tell him that I am making my special covenant of peace with him. In this covenant, I give him and his descendants a permanent right to the priesthood. For in his zeal for me, his God, he purified the people of Israel, making them right with me. The unhesitating zeal of God's holy hit man earned him his unique status as having a lifetime promise of God's special covenant 
of peace. I don't know what else was included with the prize, but we know God really appreciated the decisiveness of Pinchas. Had he asked, I think he could have talked God into throwing in a new microwave, a washer-dryer combo, and a timeshare in Cabo. But the massacre was just getting into high gear. You see, then God commanded Moses to attack and destroy this woman's people. The Midianites were cursed. But what did they do to be cursed by God? Then the Lord said to Moses, attack the Midianites and destroy them because they assaulted you with deceit and tricked you into worshiping Baal. Wait, how can folks be tricked into worshiping a pagan god? The trick was connected to the reason for the final assignment given by God to Moses. To understand this, we need to jump ahead a few chapters where God explained the chicanery in rather specific terms. Did you know that the final task assigned to Moses, it was to exact God's holy revenge on the Midianites and then die. Then the Lord said to Moses on behalf of the people of Israel, take revenge on the Midianites for leading them into idolatry. After that, you will die and join your ancestors. Okay, God was specific. But, you know, if I was fresh off the turnip truck reading this would make me want to ask, dude, how did this whole Midianite thing happen? Who was really to blame for this mess? Now, just in case you're like me and you find this a bit bizarre, let me unpack it for you. The responsible culprit has three entire chapters of the Bible dedicated to his life. Additionally, if you look carefully, you can find a number of cryptic references about his flaws scattered throughout the Old and New Testaments. But the remarkable thing is that there's barely one phrase discussed about this guilty skunk's inglorious death. Before I can move on to the next section of this investigation and tell you the rest of the story behind God's holy hitman, I must digress for the benefit of my boomer friends who may enjoy a good belly laugh in the middle of this rather tragic account. This is for my more seasoned, experienced friends who share some of my childhood memories. Most older people are familiar with Mr. Ed. He was a talking horse on a TV show named after him in the early 1960s. Folks my age can probably even sing the theme song. You can sing along with me. A horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one can talk to a horse, of course, that is, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. Ed. If you're from my generation, you may recall the owner of the horse was a character named Wilbur Post. <laughs> Once again, I know there are some boomers out there right now doing an imitation of Mr. Ed calling out his owner's name, Wilbur. <laughs> I'm not even going to apologize for this because I like it, and I hope you will too. But you see, in the sitcom, Wilbur was the only human who could communicate with Mr. Ed. And that dilemma led to hilarious circumstances. The smart aleck horse became a TV star. Now, you may wonder, who cares about a talking horse or a TV show from 1961? I do. I'm a writer and a TV producer, and I wonder how a guy came up with such a cockamamie idea. Well. Like the theme song says, no one can talk to a horse. Actually, well, I guess talking to a horse is easy. Anyone can do that. But when the horse talks back, that's a circus act to which I would buy a ticket. And that is probably why the famous comedian George Burns actually financed the pilot program 
for Mr. Ed. More about Mr. Burns in a moment. But first, I want to mention that the creator of the Mr. Ed program actually wanted to produce a different TV series. His name was Arthur Lubin. One of Mr. Lubin's claims to fame was giving Clint Eastwood his first film contract, where he played opposite a talking mule. Mr. Lubin actually directed six films about Francis the talking mule in the 1950s. Lubin failed to secure the rights for Francis to transition from film to television. And as a result, most of us have forgotten about Francis the talking mule, but some of us still remember Mr. Ed. Arthur Lubin's other more memorable credit, it was a, a great success on TV. Even the famously cheap comedian Jack Benny had gotten involved in Mr. Ed's success. Now, Jack Benny was known for playing the violin and for being famously cheap. But Mr. Benny saw value in that talking horse. He and his best friend, George Burns, helped launch Mr. Ed. And in case you're too young to remember George Burns, he was a remarkable cigar-smoking comedian. Burns played everything from vaudeville to God. And I want to move back to our conversation about God. You see, God didn't create a talking horse named Mr. Ed, and neither did he create a talking mule named Francis. And by now, you may think you know where this is going, but I'll venture a guess that you're only partway there. Yes, God did create a talking donkey, and that creature only talked to his owner. His owner was not named Wilbur. He was named Balaam, and the donkey was neither named Francis, nor was it a mule. You know, there are significant differences. Mules come from a male donkey mating with a female horse. By the way, mules are the end of the line. They don't reproduce. But what is genuinely relevant is the fact that Balaam's donkey saved his life. It's a very famous account reported in countless Sunday school lessons and in even more sermons. However, just in case you were gone that day, the summary is simple. A guy named Balaam was hired to declare a curse on Israel. He was promised great wealth if he accepted the bribe of the bad guy who was afraid of Israel. Balaam acted like a good guy in the things that he said, but in spite of outwardly appearing righteous, I think he really wanted that big payday. Now, the Sunday school children's tale that many folks remember tell the story that his donkey saw an angry angel trying to kill Balaam, but all the writer could see was that his donkey was running off the road and into walls. Balaam got angry and violently punished the animal. The animal objected and gave Balaam an earful. In essence, Balaam was told to quit beating his ass or he'd regret it. Eventually, Balaam recognized something weird was happening. Animals don't talk to people, and this one saved his life. So. That's the overview of our donkey whisperer. For my purposes, both Mr. Ed, Francis the talking mule, and even the King James rendering of the Bible account are not the end of the line. For me, it is the very beginning of a very, very, very short message. The King James version of Balaam's account says, Balaam rose up in the morning and saddles his ass and went. The text is not the point of this rabbit trail. Actually, this was all just a clever segue back to the extremely short but insightful factoid I presented before the boomer detour. How come three entire chapters of the Bible are committed to the life of Balaam, but only one short phrase 
is spent on his death. Let me read Balaam's big finale to you. It's found in Numbers chapter 31, verse 8. Therein we read that God commanded Moses to kill all the fellows who had led Israel into idolatry. God's vengeance was meted out on the Midianite army, and this body count included the names of all five kings of Midian. Then one phrase is added that sums up our culprit's entire obituary. It said, Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. Three entire chapters devoted to his life. One phrase for his obit. This report was later validated by the understudy of Moses. Joshua provided corroborating evidence. He told of the event in descriptive detail that Balaam was a soothsayer. One translation labeled him a magician. Another called him one who practices divination. Call him a man who talked to his ass or the donkey whisperer. I don't care. I can tell you this. I don't want to be remembered by one short phrase that defines my death. I think we should think about our obituaries while we can still have them changed. What do you think? How do you want to be remembered? What will be your legacy? You ever think about it? If not, you should. If this goofy commentary about a TV show that I enjoyed as a kid has caused you to think, if even briefly, about your legacy, my work here is done. <laughs> oh, wait. That was another very famous line from a different childhood hero, the Lone Ranger. He often said it after foiling the bad guys, helping the damsel in distress, or letting his sidekick Tonto know that the episode was concluded. My work here is done. <laughs> well, not exactly. There really is much, much, much more to, to the story of the fella who talked to his ass. And someone needs to finally explain where some of those pesky ites in the Bible came from. Since you don't get this stuff in Sunday school, you'll just need to come back for more Bible treasure hunting at Crosstalk.